name and not by <laughs> face. I'm yes. Kyle Hudson. I'm one of the new sysadmins here. I started last October. Back there, Adam Tiger. I've been here since 2008. Over here. I'm Dan Andreessen. I'm the director for the center that nominally oversees these two. Um, and I've been here since 97. And so um, I will point out I'll be taking some pictures for future marketing purposes and to keep my masters at the National Science Foundation happy. So if you're in the Federal Witness Protection Program or otherwise don't want your picture ever appearing online, please let me know or you know, shriek and hold your face or something and I won't take your picture. Otherwise, I'll assume that if you're here and eating my food, that you're willing to uh, have your picture taken and be used for marketing purposes. <laughs> um, so, incidentally, we do have some uh, iced tea. There's a water fountain right across the hallway. Bathrooms are here and in the main atrium. Uh, there's some strawberries, carrots, uh, various cookies, that sort of thing. And we'll be having breaks uh, about the hour, on the hour, about 10 minutes or so. And I'm sure you're about to say this, but. Uh, in, in the event that we're going over something you know, or at least you think you know, or find boring, feel free to check out mentally, surf the web, answer email, we understand. Or even and physically, we, you, you get a problem. I'm not going to yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be okay. So there's not a test over this, it's all, it's all what you want to get out of it. And the material will be available online afterwards, so if you go home and say, man, Kyle was awesome, the videos will be available as well as the slides and overhead and that sort of thing. Yeah, I sent out a link to everybody that was registered, uh, kind of gets to Adobe Connect, that should be available right shortly after this is, is finished. Um, the video is off this little webcam down here, so it may be a little spotty, depends on where I happen to be standing at the time. Um, Adam is also gonna be uh, filming it for, for a little, yeah. Buster. For future use, <laughs> hopefully get a little better quality out of that one. And also, if you have questions, feel free, you know, raise your hand, blurt out stuff. I I am very good at teaching people one-on-one. -on -one. I've never taught a class this large before, so feel free. I, I, I'm really comfortable with the interaction kind of thing, so if, you, if, you, if I lost you somewhere along the way, please just get, get my attention somehow, blurt something out. This is all interactive. We're all good friends here, and uh, so I yes. So I'm kind of curious about the makeup since I don't recognize a lot of you, which means you aren't computer science. Um, the who we got? What are the major groups here? I know Nora is statistics. So statistics, maybe you raise your hand. Excellent. Uh, biological, biological sciences, kind of big data, that sort of thing. Uh, chemistry, Any chemists in here. Uh, no back, solid block. We <laughs> have strong bonds. Um, <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, mathematics. Anybody from math? Okay, got at least one here. Excellent. Um, who am I missing? Physics. Got a physicist. Excellent. Uh, anybody from like mechanical engineering or uh, civil engineering? Anything along that line? Good. Got at least one. Great. Well, I hope it's worthwhile. This is the first time. Well, for Kyle certainly to teach this. This is the first time to try a teaching session like this. Uh, be gentle, but feel free to send us email afterwards saying, you know, here's some ways you really could have improved. Um, or if it helped, then let us know too, and uh, and we could take it. Uh, these guys are sysadmins. They're used to getting very angry emails as well as occasional happy emails. You've got so, really thick skin. Yeah, <laughs> so they, they can handle it, and, uh, you know, it also gives us an excuse to go and ask for more money. So, you know, uh, occasionally say, hey, you need more resources. This is not a bad thing. So I think you're good. All right. Well, we're going to start off with kind of the tools of the trade, the things that we need to interact with BayoCat. Uh, to begin with, everything that we use is through a, a session called SSH. SSH is a secure shell. It's a way of remotely connecting in from wherever you happen to be on the globe back over to our system. Uh, the most common one that you see on Windows is called Putty. Uh, you notice I, I put <coughs> the noob safe ones. The putty is still not a, the most friendly thing you'll ever find, but it's as, as close as you'll find because SSH doesn't use mouse interactions. It's all strictly text-based. It's you know it's a command line interface. So putty is the, the main one we use on Windows, and I will show you a putty session here. I'm just going to log in with ours. And I have not even logged in with Putty. I just downloaded a couple minutes ago on this machine. So when I go to log in, I'm going to go to Bayocat, 
you can read this, cis.ksu.edu. I'll have this in bigger letters on the screen later. And it's an SSH session down here. Everything else should be defaults. First time you log in, it'll ask you if, if you're really sure you want to do this because it keeps track of uh, keys of how, of how it does a secure session. So make sure nobody's impersonating us. Of course, if this is the first time you've seen this, you probably have no idea whether it's actually correct or not. But right. just, you know, click OK, like you do the end user license agreements. So yes. It'll probably be OK. You have a very nice tutorial online to do this. Uh, Yes, thanks to Adam who yes. recorded it. It's on YouTube. We're practically famous. Tens of people have viewed our videos. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So can we copy the slides? After yeah. I, matter of fact, I will show you. I actually have this whole PowerPoint okay. available on Veocat. Okay. On Veocat. So once you logged in and, and we go through some of the examples we have in the future, you'll see how you're going to copy things over, and uh, so you'll that'll come from the same spot. You'll just be able to copy it over using these same things that I'm getting ready to show you here. Okay, so this is my, what I first look at when I when I log in. All it has is my name, uh, the host I'm on. Uh, your your prompt may vary a little bit depending on how how you have things set up. Uh, mine set up with a percent sign that's saying I'm ready for you to tell me what to do. <laughs> really exciting stuff. Uh, when I was a student uh, working here, I actually had somebody log into a Unix system for the first time. Most of the time at this point, if you said you needed a Unix account, you knew what you, you, knew what you wanted to do. And uh, they said, I need a Unix account. So I waited for you to use a Unix account. She comes back about two or three minutes later and says, it didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? Because all it says is Unix percent. Yes, that's what it did. That's, that's all you get. The joke about Unix is it's not a user-friendly operating system. It's user-hostile using OS. But. Unfortunately, that's what we're stuck using with. Uh, however, it does have some real good advantages for what we have to do. The other uh, program, that, the other thing you're going to need to use is, is part of the SSH protocol, so if anybody's using this SSH, is it's called PSFTP or P, or excuse me, SFTP, I'm, I'm thinking of putty terms, or, uh, or SCP. That's Secure Copy, Secure FTP. FTP is File Transfer Protocol, for those of you who've been on around the internet forever like me, sorry. <laughs> I get, I get caught up in the jargon just like everybody else. We're big into TLAs, you know, the three letter acronyms. Um, probably the easiest one to use for just about any platform, whether you have a Linux desktop or a, a uh, OS X desktop or Windows, there's a platform for all this called uh, FileZilla. Uh, WinSCP is another one for Windows that's also fairly easy to use, but I'm gonna use a, a FileZilla. You can see all I did up here was I put in for host Veocat, except I put SFTP at the beginning. And that tells it I'm going to use the SFTP protocol. I put in my username and password. And that gets me over. So now, when you see what we got here, we've got all my files on this side, and this is what I have on my local disk on this side. So. Like for instance, I just copied my PowerPoint to the desktop, which I had saved out there. If I click on desktop, this will show me all the files I have on my desktop here locally. Right now, this will tell me I'm looking in, this is my home directory, and then the Veocat intro folder that I that I saved everything in. Kyle? Yes? Any, any relative advantages of file? Do you have a relative <laughs> Not really. I just find it to be, I, I find it to be very easy to use. So that's that's the only reason why I recommend it. Um, we 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 kind of recommend it just because it's uh, cross platform. It's available everywhere. We take the same pictures. It works the same everywhere. Okay. So that that's the only reason. When, when, you, when you get to the point where you're using Unix or Linux most of the time, like I am, I don't even deal with the the GUI. Okay. I, I use the command line stuff. Those are available on OS 10 and on uh, on Linux also, and uh, even Windows. Putty has a has a P, SCP, which does the same thing. You just type the P at the beginning, and, okay. and it works just like SCP. Uh, so those are all available. And easy to use. Um, OpenSSH is built into Mac and Linux. So if you don't mind using a command interface instead of a GUI, 
that's already built in. Um, Windows has several different ones. Uh, you have Fuddy, you have OpenSSH from SigWin. SigWin is a series of, of Unix tools that's available on Windows. There's, I, I looked online, there's a hundred and some odd open source ones available. Uh, SCP or S FTP, same thing. Like I said, uh, they're all available through the OpenSSH tools. And that's how we transfer files into and out of BeoCat is with SCP or SFTP. We uh, interact on the system using SSH. So now we're going to go into how to use Linux. How many of you guys are familiar with Linux? <laughs> Dan, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're familiar with Linux. <laughs> so this, this will be one of those parts that may bore you to tears if you've done a lot of this before. Yes. We're just going to go through some of the, the uh, Linux command line tools here. Some of the things you'll most likely see. And I have this, as you'll be able to see. If you go to the BeoCat support page, there is a link at the top that says Linux Basics. And that will take you to this URL. If you go to beocat.cisakc.edu, it'll redirect you to the support pages. And uh, But Linux Basics is right there near the front. <coughs> so this is what we have on the page here. We're just going to go over some of the terms that we use quite a bit and, and some of the basic commands. I think you could blow that up a little bit. At least I forgot my binoculars today. Haha, -ha, there you go. I'm surprised that I remembered that. <laughs> I did that. So. Okay. Uh, in, in Windows, they, in, in DOS land, they used to have what's called a directory. Now they started calling them folders. The Unix guys never got over that. We still call them directories. So anytime you hear me talk about changing directories or working directories, that type of thing, that's just the folder that you're in. The shell is what you're interacting with all the time. Whenever I first log into <coughs> BeoCat, I log into what's called ZSH, or the Z shell. Uh, campus default is called TCSH, the, the what, the TC, what, C shell, so, something C shell. It, it's matter. an improved C shell. Yeah. It's a... It's, it's just something you'll see, in, and Bash is probably the other common, common one, the, the Born shell. That is a way of interacting with the system. That's what gives you that percent up here. It's what gives you your name at the beginning. It lets you define your environment variables, that type of thing, which we're going to go over here in a bit, too. SSH, secure shell, we just talked about that. SCP, secure copy, we just talked about that. The path, that's a list of directories that when you type the name of a program. So, for instance, if I type, actually if I do set, I'm going to use some magic here. Thank you so much for that. This is telling you what directories that it's going to look in, or what folders you're going to be looking in for files. You'll notice that there's all, all these things that are local to our system. There's I've added some more stuff for my own. My, I added my own binaries folder in there. Um, we have stuff in there for SGE, which is our scheduling system. But the one thing that confuses a lot of people is that the current directory is usually not in there. So unlike Windows, where you if you look at something in the on the, if you see a directory listing and, the, and there's an executable right there and you try to run it, on Linux a lot of times it'll say, you can't find that because you didn't tell it to run it from there. You, you've told it, look at all these different places, but you didn't ever tell it to run, run it from where you are right now, which is a little different if you're, if you're used to a Windows kind of system. Ownership and permissions, these are kind of uh, directly related. And usually the time you'll want to refer back to this 
as if you're copying from somebody else's stuff. Uh, I put a lot of my stuff out there. As a matter of fact, I think I have everything of mine open for everybody to use. But so you might copy it over and then you don't have permission to run it. So you need to change permissions and ownership of it. You change, change yourself to the own owner. There, I would say just going onto this page if, you're, if you need to get to that point. I'm not gonna go over now. It's a little arcane, you'll, I'll bore everybody. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna hear anybody snoozing. I mean, if you do, you do, but I'm not gonna try to get there. Um, switches are what we call the, the dash commands. You're, we're gonna, we'll use these a lot with Veocat. Uh, when you submit a job, you say, uh, for instance, dash L, uh, then your runtime, or dash L, and then, your, and then your, your, how many CPUs you want. So we're, that, that's what we call a command line switch. So if you hear us refer to that, that's what we're talking about. And finally, pipes and redirects, and again, I'm not gonna go real deep into this, but they're really pretty handy when you go to interact with a Linux system. That allows you to take the output of one program and send it to another. Matter of fact, I just did it a little bit ago. You, if you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't, didn't know what I did. I saw, I, I got a list of all the environment variables, and then I said, and then send that to a program called less, which lets me look through it up and down. Some common lines here. Uh, I tried to, I, I was, again, I'm gonna let you refer back to this page more than anything else. Uh, print working directory, let you know where you are, the, the path. Uh, ls for listing files and folders, cd for changing directories, cp for copy, mv for move. Back in the early days of Unix, space was at a premium, so they abbreviated everything to like two and three characters. So the old commands are all really short like this. rm for remove. Uh, and one other quick thing here is we're going to, I'm going to be using, when I do examples here, uh, if we edit files, you guys are probably going to use one called Nano if you ever logged into Beocat. It's a it's a easy to use text editor. Probably very similar to Notepad on Windows. I don't use that. I use the one called VI. VI has a very steep initial learning curve, but if you're going to be spending any time on Linux, I highly recommend that you use it. You can do a whole lot of things a whole lot faster once you once you get in, get to use it. So. Uh, but Nano, the one we'll have you guys use probably most often, is uh, it has like a list at the bottom that says push this key, push control X to save and exit or something like that. So it'll take it'll take care of all that for you, and, and it's fairly easy to use because of that. So to supercomputers as a whole, what defines a supercomputer? I define the supercomputer. Size? Size, actually it's not so much size, Dollars. but that's, I mean, that, 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 that's, kind of, that's kind of necessary for what we're doing though. <laughs> CPUs, a lot of CPUs, yes. What else defines the supercomputer? Pardon? How, how fast it runs, yes. Generally, kind of rule of thumb speaking, a supercomputer is about what you'll see on a regular server in about 10 years, give or take. Um, there is no one hard and fast definition of what a supercomputer is. What we do is we take a whole bunch of computers. They are servers like you can go and buy from Dell. Matter of fact, several of them are, ours are from Dell, the most recent ones we did. And we hook them up in a specific way so that they all work together as one unit. Now, in our type of case, we have a scheduling system where we can partition off and you get so, so long and you get so long and you get this amount and you get that amount and, and it all, we have systems that take care of all that scheduling and all that type of thing. What types of problems are solved by supercomputers? Nora, what kind of problems are solved by good supercomputers? <laughs> I'm gonna pick on you a lot since I know you. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell, tell you what I use them for. Uh -huh. um, I have, for example, very large simulation studies mm -hmm. where uh, I'm looking at many, many different scenarios, many different replicates. Uh, each of them turns out to be 
a job or a job in an array, mm -hmm. and if I were to run them in my computer, I would probably be waiting for the whole thing to run for two years, or here I can get it done maybe in a week, a couple of weeks, if anybody has been trying to send things for the past two weeks. Mm -hmm. That'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what I'd use it for. And yeah. they're usually pretty long jobs, jobs that could uh, uh, render my, my computer unusable days at a time. Yes, exactly. You pretty much hit everything that we talk about. <laughs> um, which is good. I, I, this is good. This is kind of all the stuff I'm looking for. Um, we're looking at things that are, first of all, large in size. Uh, some of our data genomics people have data sets that are a terabyte. How many people of you have, have a terabyte of RAM on your computer at home? Oh. <laughs> we, we have a few of those. Not at home. That's what I'm saying. Your department has one? Yes. But you, you certainly had to pull funds to make that happen. Right? Because <laughs> those don't come cheap, I can promise you. Um, fast speed. Uh, like I said, we, uh, you, you can run several hundred cores, several hundred CPUs working on a particular problem. Uh, in Nora's case, she's doing parameter seek. So she's changing one little thing here, and then she's having to run something for a week, and changing one little thing and have to run it for a week. Like I said, if you're running that one after the other, that would take forever by being able to say, hey, we can use this computer, and 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 I'll have that done and have them all run simultaneously, that, that gives her a, a big advantage. Mm -hmm. Reliability. How many of you can keep, say your computer stays up for a month at a time? Reliably. Mine sometimes <laughs> does. If I, was, if I was relying on it, I don't think I, I would trust it. I would definitely want to put a UPS on it, that type of thing. Of course, if they're turning to Theocat over the lap over Christmas or so, they'd be arguing the same thing again. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we did have some issues there. Uh, we we're, we we uh, upgraded the power in our come find a seat, please. <laughs> we upgraded the power in our server room, and things didn't go as well as planned at times. We had some some downtime that we were not expecting, and some that we were that frustrated people. And for those of you that that was, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, we uh, things that we've used for BayoCat for uh, genome analysis, particle physics simulations, ecological forecasting, uh, statistical analysis, those types of things. So, uh, as far as how big things scale, we've got about two thousand, somewhere north of two thousand cores, and coming more coming soon. Uh, two thousand that that makes us not a real big one. We're the biggest in the state of Kansas. Our total RAM is pretty good comparative to other supercomputers around the around college campuses. We're certainly not near the top 10 by any stretch. Uh, the biggest supercomputer, I looked up the statistics on it, the uh, Titan at Oak Ridge National Labs. We told you we have about 2,000 cores. They have 500,000 cores. We have about 12 terabytes of RAM. They have 700. and. Uh, they run at 27, over 27 petaflops. That's trillion operations per second, blade point operations per second. So that's, they, they scale much bigger than what we have here. However, that being said, we're still, like I said, the biggest in the state. And uh, it's, it's, that doesn't, it's not, it's more, it's not just peanuts what we got going on in there either. So I will, and I will sort of blurb here, if your needs are scaling beyond BayoCat, I'm also the Exceed Campus Champion, so the Exceed resources, the, the supercomputer centers that are nationwide and national scale, and part of my job is to help people get on and use them. Now to use BayoCat, you send us an email and I say, sure, you've got an account, have fun. To use them, you have to set up and make a proposal and say, I need X hundred, that sort of thing. However, I do have a, I, while it'd be large on BayoCat, a small hunk of time, compute time, that I have available to me as the campus champion for KSU. And so if you want to get on and try out some of the bigger machines, send me an email. I'm dan at ksu.edu, and we can start working on that sort of thing as well. So as you scale past BayoCat, feel free to talk to me, and we can work on getting you on some of the national scale supercomputers as well.
because K-State isn't going to be coming through with $10 million for us anytime soon to uh, get one of those on our systems. Very good. Supercomputers, we tend to talk about a lot about parallelism. So, what is parallelism? Put a pain in the butt. What's that? A pain in the butt. Okay. It can be <laughs> a pain in the butt. Ho hopefully, we try to take the pain in the butt part out of you, out of it for you, both for the most part. What, is, what does it mean when we say parallelism? Trying to run multiple resources at the same time to tackle a problem. Exactly. Multiple resources at the same time. Now, I'll put this up here. Hard programming is hard. The, this, if there's one thing that people don't understand about supercomputers, about, about running things in parallel, that is no system can make your systems magically run in parallel. There are too many difficult problems that arise when you just try to say, and we have people come in and say, yes, I've got this program, it runs great for me, I can run 80 times faster if I run it on one of the mages that we have in here which has 80 cores on it, and they'll request 80 cores, and they'll come in here and they'll, their job will run, and it will use one. And you, and, but because I reserved it for 80, then nobody else can use that system, and that's not a good thing. So, I don't remember if I have one. Yeah, I have, have it on here. Some problems are harder than others to run in parallel. And this is where we're going to get into a whole lot more stuff here. Um, I'm going to give, give some examples here. If you have a set of n variables of 1, 2, 3, up through n, and I say run, I want this to compute b to be 4 times a, how easy is that to run in parallel? How, how? Very easy. I can set this, I, I can, you have to program to do so. but you can set one core to do the one, and you can set another core to do two, and another core to do three, and whenever the first one's done, it can do number 127. And that, that becomes a, a very easy problem to solve in parallel. What about the next one down here? Uh, B to be 11 times A to the N, times, that was supposed to be a squared, times E to the A to the N plus log of sub A to the N to the 17. How easy is that to parallelize? It's also very easy to parallelize. It's a much more difficult mathematical problem, but you're still only doing one thing. You have, you have this guy can be working on one because this is all the same end down here. The next guy can work on two. Same, same kind of thing. It's, it's a bigger mathematical problem, but it's not any harder to parallelize. Now, what about this one? I, set, I initialize to be zero, and I say b to the n is a to the n plus b to the n minus one. Uh, that should be e n minus one. <laughs> that should have been a subscript. Sorry. <laughs> How hard is that to parallelize? Very hard. Very hard. Because you have to know the previous value here before you can get back to this this uh, before we can before we can compute the next value of n. It doesn't matter. How much parallelism I throw at that problem, I'm not going to get it going any faster by running running it in parallel. So that's what that's one of those things that, and, and that's typically what we see here. We typically usage we see on our systems is that you'll see some part that can be really easily parallelized. We have a, a little piece here that iterates over an array or some piece that can that we can figure out really fast. But then they'll need that, res that entire result before it does the next part. So you will parallelize part of it, and then it'll have, have to have some serial part. And then parallelize a big part of it, and then the serial part. That's fairly typical usage on not just us, but on any of the systems, that the, any of the supercomputer systems you'll see. There are lots of ways of breaking that down. You can do it within your program. And you know, as you're doing that little, that little serial part, you, know, you can have, you can have 16 cores reserved that you're using all the time, and use one for a little while, and then go back to using all 16 again. That's fine. Uh, we don't want that little part, that, that serial part, to be running for days, because that means nobody else can use the other 15 cores that you're not using. You can do this kind of manually. You can break your own program into steps. Say, hey, here's a parallel part, and then I'll work on this. The other uh, thing that we see a lot of, and the reason why this is, this is my big plug plug. 
for Baocat. The reason why people invest in, in Baocat is because typical usage is you'll work on a problem and you'll have heavy, heavy, real heavy compute needs for maybe a month, two, three weeks, maybe a month. And then you sit back and you analyze your results for six months to a year. And it'll take you that long before you're doing that. And if by using a centralized resource like Baocat, then you've not, you're not, you're not consuming your own resource. You're not sitting there having machines running for no purpose, not doing anything for long periods of time. Next part, we're actually getting into some programming stuff. So actually, I went kind of fast over that last bit. Any questions, comments, snide remarks? <coughs> yes? Are you adding any GPUs to the OCAM extension? Uh, we're not adding any. We have 16 uh, GPU-enabled systems right now. And I don't know if anybody that's using them as GPU systems. Mm -hmm. so. Show, show me a use case and I'd be delighted. I've yes. got a friend that works at Intel on the Intel 5 program. And he said, look, I'll get you some on a sample basis if you can prove you'll use them. And I just kind of go, I can't <laughs> at the moment. So yeah, it's definitely something we're looking at. A lot of the biggest systems are, I think about 50% of the top 20 systems have GPU accelerators or Intel Phi accelerators at the moment. And if you've got the code that runs on them, they're awesome. Otherwise, they just burn power and slow things down. Yeah, we, when we first got in, this is before I got here, obviously, but my understanding is before when we got the GPU systems, there was a lot of people that were interested in doing this, and then we got them in, and they're like, yeah, it doesn't fit so well as, as we thought it was going to be. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah, no, the general, the general problem is that the, so A, most of the people on campus don't burn their own code, they use somebody else's package, and most of the packages that people use on campus don't either don't support GPUs or the parts that we use on campus don't use GPUs even though the package as a whole says, hey, we support CUDA. And we said, awesome. Like uh, John and Chen over in biochemistry uses Nomdi. And Nomdi is an awesome package. Parts of it really make use of GPUs. The part he uses doesn't. <laughs> and so it's just, oh man. And so it, it, it's an issue. Any other questions? If you want to know more about this, I'm, I'm putting a plug in here because I stole a lot of stuff from OU. They have a, a series out there called Supercomputing in Plain English. That's the link for it. Again, I'll show you how to get to this one after, after a bit here. Uh, don't go all my slides, I should say. And uh, they, they have a, uh, they had it, so it was all streaming. And then he redid the course this spring. And he doesn't have the live streams up yet, so you all, you, all you have is the PowerPoints. But uh, he, his stuff is, is, he spent a lot of time getting things to, uh, to so that people can understand supercomputing. I say supercomputing in plain, plain English was a really good title for what he has there. Um, our own support pages, www.bayocat.cis.psu.edu. Yes, there's a lot of dots in there, it's the way it works. And of course, you can email us at baocat at cis.psu.edu. And we have people do that all the time. That's completely fine. That's what we're there for. So if I don't have any more questions, I guess we're done for a little bit here. Take a break. Uh, I think we have some more people coming in about 2 o'clock or so. People already knew they didn't need this part. So, so what's coming up at 2? At 2, we are going to talk about parallel programming. And we're going to go through several parallel programming examples. Okay. So feel free to get some iced tea, get some uh, get some food, come back here at two, and or don't if you feel like, hey, I don't need it, then we'll go from there. So thanks for coming out so far.